Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, I hope you have enough time to wake up during the previous talk. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Fabian, for waking you up. Uh, I'm going, uh, well, first, who am I? And I um, have to make uh, two disclosures here. First, uh, I'm the wrong person in the wrong place. I'm not a software guy. And the second one, the initially this talk was submitted for the debugging tools, uh, dev, dev rooms, but then for whatever reason relocated here. So I am not really sure how relevant it will be for you. Uh, and what I'm doing for a living, instead of software development, I am designing hardware, embedded hardware, and using software to bring up this hardware to make it run. But since uh, for the last five, ten years, most of work is concentrated on the FPGA systems. Uh, the problem is not only how to bring this uh, software running, but how to bring all the hardware platform for this software up and running, including the uh, soft core or integrated hardcore uh, CPU processors. So uh, today I'm going to talk, uh, just make a short <coughs> overview how it's possible to debug not software, but to uh, do the hardware debugging. But to do it with a free and open software, and fortunately enough, it's uh, possible all the pieces are here, and I can just uh, uh, say, uh, summarize the entire presentation in one word. All the free software, all the pieces are here, but integration between them is really missing. So you have to uh, assemble puzzle from different uh, pieces together just to make anything running. And uh, how many of you in this audience uh, know what the FPGA is or have used FPGA? Wow. Okay. <laughs> then perhaps you know everything I'm going to tell next and even quite possible that you know it much more than I do. <laughs> Nevertheless, a few words why I think that software de developers should care about the FPGAs because uh, and those are, of course, some uh, pretty hard statements, which are not true, 100% true. <laughs> but all the, for the last 10 years, all the modern architectures, CPU architectures, are pretty much stuck in their development. And to get any performance, you have to go to non-standard architectures or to custom hardware accelerators or to reconfigurable hardware to accelerate it. And uh, for the last 30 years, 40 years already, all the uh, hardware development is based on two languages. Both of them are, say, niche languages, VHDL and Verilog, and the preferable one depends on what side of Atlantic you are at. <laughs> uh, well, there are some variations, so the, there are people in the States who know uh, uh, VHDL, there are people in Europe who write some very log, but generally, yeah, depending on what side of Atlantic you are, is you're choosing one or the other language. But unfortunately, compared to the uh, software progress, what we saw through the last uh, 20 years, uh, those two languages are still very, very old. Despite the new standards, very log 2008, VHDL 2011, and the common one 2020, those technologies are pretty much lacking behind, and the uh, industry itself is very conservative about uh, taking any new approaches. Uh, so well, uh, why this is needed for software developers? Because uh, you, we have to make run our software on uh, mailable, changeable, programmable, and heterogeneous architectures, and because the industry needs some uh, kick from outside to move forward. Otherwise, they will stay there with their obsolete tools forever. Uh, as I said, the free software is available and uh, very actively developed for the, under active development for the, uh, so, uh, for the RTL designers, and both uh, VHDL and Verilog are supported. Um, I'm not that much in the Verilog HDL, so we'll talk uh, afterwards about the uh, 
VHDL. But nevertheless, very later, Icarus Verilog are excellent fast simulators, compiler to, from Verilog to C, C++, or just an interpreting uh, simulator. And uh, uh, Yosis is an excellent system which provides the full path from the Verilog description, RTL description, down to the hardware. Unfortunately, only for the supported hardware architectures, but it's going to be extended and it's under active development. So everything is good here, but, uh, and it's much more convenient for software people and for hardware people as well. Before you go to the uh, hardware, you have to simulate it first. And if you can catch uh, half of your errors in simulation, that's good. If you can catch 90% of your errors in simulation, that's even better because you have another 90% related to the hardware platforms. <laughs> <laughs> so better to separate them. And for VHDL simulation, there is a nice uh, compiler. Uh, it's a part of uh, the uh, GNU compiler suite. It's a uh, GHDL, and it's written on the niche language on ADA. So there is actually not only embedded software, but a uh, quite conventional PC software written on ADA, which is a bit surprising and making it a bit more difficult to read. And uh, there is a nice GUI front end to look, because the hardware people are not uh, speaking the same language as software, so we do not compile anything, we synthesize and place and wrote it. And we are not uh, running printf debugging, we are looking to the blinking LEDs. I hope they are still blinking. Yes, uh, I'm not sure how visible it is, but we will come later to it. That's a quite common way to debug hardware. It's just blinking. Uh, but, uh, of course, there is a GUI front end to look on the traces, and it's uh, much more pleasant to the eyes than the blinking LEDs afterwards. Since we are going first to simulate, this is a very small snippet of the code I'm going to debug and simulate. It's a simple uh, generator, uh, data pattern generator to run tests against and to test it, and it supports two modes. In one, it's a simple binary counter, and in the more advanced mode, it's a linear feedback shift register. And as you see, the code itself is just uh, eight, 10 lines, uh, with all the uh, uh, boilerplate uh, code around it, and VHDL is quite verbose language. It's around 45, 50 lines in the file, but the same file can be uh, simulated, run on the uh, uh, GHDL and v traces can be viewed in GUI, and the physically the very same file can be later on combined, compiled, synthesized, and placed in road for FPGA, and then we can debug it on the hardware. That's a nice and not quite readable screenshot, and now I will try to switch to the. Oh, okay, it's here. Oh. So we are going to LA demo. Oops. As you see, as the screen, oh, yeah, it's even better than a PDF. Uh, just run GHDL several times to synthesize several blocks and run a simulation for a while. And now, if we start make without magic. It's here, exactly what you saw on the screenshot, and we can see two separate, oops, if I can scroll it now. Uh-huh, I can. Uh-huh, we see those two different running modes, the binary count one and the linear feedback shift, shift register. You see the one is walking through the register. Here. And zero, all bits zeros, is a possible state for the binary counter, of course, and it's a dead state for the uh, linear feedback shift register. So if you move to that one, uh, for the software developers, I think the, all the work is uh, done here. We have a code, we can compile it, we can run the simulation, we can get a picture. <laughs> it's working. We are done. Uh, not quite true for the hardware. So, oops, sorry for that. So we have to go for 
the, uh, down to the real hardware. And at this place, we are completely, uh, we have completely to surrender to the vendor tools, because except for the Yosis and uh, uh, Lattice uh, and some low-end Xilinx platform, there is no way to place and route and to generate a bit stream for the uh, real hardware, for the real FPGA. Uh, I really hope that sometime soon it will change for, at least for some Altera Intel FPGAs, if uh, someone of you will contribute to that. Uh, and for the on-chip, on hardware debugging, there are tools uh, from all the vendors. Altera has a signal tab, Xilinx chip scope, Synopsys has identity RTL debugger, which is running on I think all the FPGA families supported by Synopsys, uh, micro semi microchip have their own smart debug features. So you actually can look inside the uh, running hardware, running FPGA chip, and uh, get the same traces. You look for the signals, and in some uh, advanced cases like the smart debug case, you can even try in, uh, to toggle some signals or to uh, twinkle some signals in the running system and see how your hardware reacts on this. Uh, what is the problem with those tools? I think that's stated in the very first line. They're proprietary and they're vendor specific. So if by some crazy decision of hardware des uh, designer, you have two different FPGAs from different vendors on the same board, you basically have to have uh, two completely different parallel setups of all the development and debugging tools. Somehow, magically, if you're lucky enough, connected to the same hardware and uh, hopefully used in parallel. Uh, haven't ever seen working it in practice, unfortunately. Even if you have to debug several, uh, two separate pieces in, inside the same FPGA, it's already a challenge with the vendor tools. If you have two different vendors, mm, and of course, uh, support engineers and field application engineers will just ask you, ah, you are using the different FPGA? Sorry, we can't help you. Uh, and that's a problem. And of course, uh, especially if you are not working in the uh, university or industrial environment, there is a cost for the licenses. And sometimes it's uh, uh, acceptable and quite reasonable. Sometimes they are charging a premium amount for basically non-working tools. Uh, but fortunately, but we can learn from them. We can look at them and uh, maybe do some somewhat better job. And what we can learn from those tools is their less common denominator how to connect to the hardware. All those tools are talking to the hardware through the IEEE 1149.1. It's also, I think, around something or so-called JTAG standard. It's simple four-wire interface to talk to. Initially, it's been intended for the hardware testing, for the interconnectivity on the board testing, but now it's uh, overused for the CPU cores debugging, for microcontroller debugging, for flash and programmable logic uh, interface and programming, configuring, debugging it. So it's, uh, I would say that it's most widely used and uh, the least, least common denominator for all the interfaces. And there is a software support, there are two um, somewhat different, somewhat separate, somewhat competing projects uh, to talk to different uh, interfaces, hardware debuggers. So besides the software running on the host system to uh, um, talk to the hardware, you need some converter from the uh, whatever interface you have on your development station. It's usually, it's nowadays, it's either USB or there are some converters uh, based on the networking. Uh, Ethernet connections, uh, but you need some converter to talk to the hardware, so USB to uh, JTAG converter. And some of them are integrated in the development board, some of them are even integrated into the final products in the Im embedded systems, or sometimes it's just a small external boxes. And uh, both URJTAG and OpenOCD uh, provide support for, I don't know, something like around 50, 100 of different interfaces. And they are pretty flexible, provide the uh, 
uh, driver IP API where you can, you can write the plugin for, to support your own interface. And then, of course, it's uh, interesting to look what is available as a free software for the uh, GUI counterpart of those vendor tools. And there is an excellent, uh, interesting project of uh, uh, Sigrog. Its uh, prime intention is to provide a uh, free and open source interface for the real hardware. Uh, so it means for the digital multimeters, uh, signal generators, logic analyzers, oscilloscopes, and for that matter, it supports a lot of uh, uh, vendor systems and uh, big and expensive uh, Tektronix, HLN, HP, uh, all all the all the stuffs. But it's also reasonably easy to provide a plugin driver for it. So it can talk to the logic analyzer, which is built in inside the FPGA. Since FPGA is very flexible, you can just uh, take some more VHDL code or some more Verilog code and build a logic analyzer inside the FPGA using its uh, internal resources and connect it to different signals uh, inside the FPGA itself. And vendor tools such as their signal tap, uh, chip scope, uh, are working exactly, and uh, uh, Synopsys Smart Debug, uh, they are working exactly at this level. They are instantiate a separate logic analyzer instance in inside your system, connected to the signals you are pointed to, you are interested to look at. And uh, then after that, you um, is able to look inside your running system to figure out what's going on there. Uh, And then, uh, of course, you can use all those tools with uh, pretty much any board you have or any FPGA platforms you have uh, because uh, they're free. And uh, this one is just an example of one of the boards. What is, yeah, and it's still uh, blinking. You see it's running a binary counter mode, I hope. And as we, yes, it's a binary counter <laughs> still. And as we saw on the, uh, Mm, uh, VHDL snapshot, it can run in second mode. I'll try to switch it now. So, yep, hope it's visible. It's a linear feedback shift register, so the bits are moving. But in this mode, of course, you can debug uh, something with 8 bits, uh, debugging something with 32 bits with the uh, um, LEDs would be possible. And uh, yesterday downstairs, I saw an excellent repli replica of PDP-11 console where you have 32 toggle switches, 32 LEDs, and you can actually uh, download code and debug it this way. But uh, with modern architectures, with uh, hundreds of registers, mm, that would be a little bit painful and too slow. So all the tools, all the pieces are actually available, and there are different projects to connect them together. But what you have to do, uh, to make it running is uh, uh, to assemble them and to make them talk to each other. Because Urgitech, uh, your Urgitech has its own interface library to talk to it. Uh, OpenOCD provides an RPC interface, uh, but uh, to this interface you have to talk uh, Tickle, which is another example of 40 years old language, I think. And it's very, very favorable by the, both VHDL and Verilog designers. <laughs> so that they don't know much about the make files, really. What they have is they have a Verilog code or VHDL code and then tickle scripts to set up and compile it. <laughs> and for, to follow this tradition, OpenOCD provides an RPC talking tickle. But which is nice, and there is an example of how to talk to this interface from Python. And what I've done for this demonstration, I wrote a simple uh, driver for the OpenOCD, oh, sorry, for LibSigrog to talk to, to the OpenOCD uh, Tico interface. So there is a plugin for the uh, GUI, for the Pulse View, for LibSigrog, which talks through the Tico interface to the OpenOCD, which in turn talks to the, through USB to the USB to JTAG converter, which in turn talks through the JTAG to the logic analyzer inside the FPGA. And uh, yes, all this code is uh, free and available on GitHub page, and it's even running. And what we can get 
running this code is this nice snapshot, a uh, screenshot of the uh, Sigrog pulse view showing basically the same picture. Uh, for whatever reason, when I've made the screenshots, they are uh, mirrored compared to the one with the simulation results. On the simulation uh, screenshot, we had a binary counter first and linear feedback shift register afterwards. Here we have a linear feedback shift register and binary counter. And I also think that bit order is swapped. But uh, what? It happens. And now let's see if I can make it run on live. Uh, here in the FPGA code demo, and actual FPGA file is also here. It's a bit bigger than the uh, small snapshot I've shown. It's initialization logic, but here is the actual code we are, we've been simulating, and now we are debugging on the real hardware. And if we run this OVG tech server. OCD are just a configuration files in Tickle for the uh, open OCD and uh, which describe how to interface to all the pieces which uh, interface to use and how to talk to it. Yes, it's running and it can, it, it sees the real hardware talking to it. So now we can just take a separate window Okay, hope it's right. So that's a uh, magic to run the pulse view and substitute it with the freshly built patched uh, Sigrog library where we should be able to see the uh, nice device. Let's see if it's still working. Okay, we have to find the device and it's here. VJ Tech is just another piece of the vendor specific code to make it uh, possible to talk from the JTEC interface of the FPGA to the uh, custom JTEC connected logic inside the FPGA but it's easy to be replaced and we have to talk over the network to the to our server and it's running on the same machine just different numbers we scan for it yes it's here that's nice now we can set up a trigger for something interesting as our dead state for the uh, feedback shift register, which is uh, all zeros. Uh, and it takes me some time. Oops. Mm, okay. Probably it's not all zeros, but nevertheless. And now we can switch it just to make it run faster. And zoom in. Uh, uh -huh. So it's a linear feedback shift register, but running now not not blinking at uh, two hertz, which are suitable for debugging on the LEDs, but running a full speed. I think the system clock frequency is 25 megahertz at the moment, so it's just an external clock. Uh, so what we see is that it's possible with the free and open software tools to look inside the running FPGA. And uh, I'm really pleased that the demo is working live. Oh, it's nice to have a small demo, but uh, the real question is what we, where we move next and what important things to be done. I think the most important thing, uh, thing to be done is an integration between tools. Because I, uh, nobody would ever been able to convince any hardware developer or any FPGA developer uh, 
for the debugging to switch from the vendor tools you are using with the one particular FPG to the open source tools. If you have to tell, you have to take this part. Uh, it's written in C. You have to compile it yourself with your own patched library. Then you have to take this part and write a configuration file on Tickle. Then you have to take that part and, uh, ah, yeah, it's written on Ada. You have to compile it for your system as well. And then you probably, if everything goes well, uh, have to connect it to your hardware, and then you can debug your hardware. No, it would take me weeks, it takes months to debug only the debugging tool chain. So some nice integration, and uh, that's something. Keep debugging standards and interfaces. IEEE standards take really long time to get accommodated. And then, of course, an integration with the GDB. In this sense, it's pretty good because OpenOCD supports the GDB, remote debugging interface, and many, many different hardware cores, but still missing the integration with software support. And uh, all this code, all the examples are available on the GitHub page. You can link to it. You can uh, send patches, you can download and start playing with it. And any questions you might have. Thank you for your attention. Oh? Oh, yes, please. Uh, so, uh, great talk. The uh, plugin hardware you usually trade off you know, visibility for, for speed. Do you see value in simulation for finding these kind of like, you know, oh. hardware bugs? So the question is the visibility versus speed during on hardware debugging. Uh, yes, with some t uh, sometimes it's a problem. And simulation is good to, to catch the logic errors, but it cannot catch all the hardware and racing conditions problems. What is good with the instrumentation running on the FPGA itself, on hardware debugging, you are, mm, let's say, less restricted by the speed, because JTAG here is running at something like uh, one megahertz, and the real signals we saw captured are running full speed, 25 megahertz, they could run 100 megahertz. And actually this uh, demonstration came from the actual project I've uh, spent last year working on, on the MicroSemi FPGA, where the actual signals were coming at a gigabit data rate. But it still was possible to capture them at the gigabit rate on the part of the FPGA, then buffer it, resynchronize, and look through the slow available debugging interfaces. So yes, there are such problems. No simulation can solve all of them. Uh, on hardware debugging is needed for that, and it makes it easier somewhat. Um, I'm sorry, but yeah, you're welcome to drop a message or just stop by later. Yeah, what you can do is just go behind and 